He is the research person for Astronomy Olympiad. Sri A.M. Sekhar sir published many papers in the area of physics, physics education, metallic glasses, and biopolymers. Sri A.M. A.M. Sekhar's professional recognition and awards. He got Infosys and RECL award for being a mentor for International Physics Olympiad. Original pendulum experiment developed and published by Sri A.M. Sekhar. which is now a part of mumbai university msc curriculum thank you sir thank you madam yeah. sir enrich please occupy the dais and enrich our valuable participants sir yeah yeah, yeah shekhar we over to you yeah thank you sir already we are running short of time yeah yeah so let me just share my screen <laughs> Yeah, Shekhar Garu is going to take us uh, through universe through Hubble's uh, telescope. I can get rid of this. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pitapuram Degrees College, for inviting me to give this talk. Okay, so let's uh, let me take you through a journey of photographs and the physics behind it, the technology behind it. <coughs> so I'd like to thank my previous speakers because uh, some part of that of my talk, which were essential, were covered by them. So. So the Hubble Space Telescope is known as the granddaddy of space telescopes. Why granddaddy? I will come to it later. So Hubble is the first NASA uh, Great Observatory. So there are four telescopes in this Great Observatory. So Hubble Space Telescope is actually a low orbit. That's around 559 kilometers about the Earth, and it is going around the Earth. Every 97 minutes. Okay. The next question is how big is Hubble? So just to get a dimension of it. So it weighs around 12,000 kgs on Earth. So in a volume size, if you look, it would be like a school bus. So what is the equipment that is on board? So obviously the primary mirrors, the secondary mirrors are there. Then there are main cameras, light spitting devices, which are known as spectrographs. gyroscopes to keep it oriented in space <coughs> sorry it was launched in 1990 with a life expectancy of 20 years uh, now it's almost 30 years but it is still working uh, thanks to the maintenance work which was done on the hubble space telescope now you would say why hubble space telescopes okay and what is its contribution so the following are the contributions if you can look at it uh, the formation of star factories uh, we could see the formation of the sun and the solar system the age old question has been answered right uh, the violence of exploding stars so new light on black holes the age and size of the universe hubble revealed where dark matter exists and it also has provided evidence for an unseen force called dark energy okay so these are its contributions so i would like to take you through a journey of uh, or plan of my talk would be hubble and equipment on board astronomical images and the need for coloring techniques i think previously so was talking on physics of colors so i'll be so i can go fast there Uh, images of star factories and how to read the images using different color coloring techniques so <clears throat> we see a lot of beautiful pictures on the internet 
okay so what they actually mean so that's what i would like to look at it uh, why study spectral lines uh, formation of planetary systems death of stars black holes hubble's deep and ultra deep field views some light on dark matter and dark energy <clears throat> uh, so let me so this is, this is normally a course which i give for 4 hours i had to curtail it down to an around an hour or so okay so why the grand daddy it is because uh, it was the one of the first telescopes to be launched by nasa after that they launched compton uh, hubble basically looks in the visible range of the spectrum uv and near infrared okay and then they had launched compton which looks into the gamma ray space and chandra named after chandrashekhar uh, it looks into the x ray uh, spectrum and spitzer which looks into the infrared uh, spectrum uh, there are other telescopes uh, which were launched by different agencies that european space agency uh, planck's observatory to look at the cosmic wave, wave micro microwave background India also has a telescope astrosat which was launched in 2015 a life expect expectancy of 5 uh, years so it's still operational so these are the four telescopes uh, which were launched by nasa uh, so this is here hubble which is on the visible i have put those pictures on this uh, spectrum so infrared you can see spitzer it will be here on the spectrum uh, this area of the spectrum will be covered by hubble space telescope the x rays uh, will be covered by chandra and the gamma rays will be covered by compton now how does hubble communicate with the uh, space center down uh, to us and how does it send the data okay so basically hubble is pointing towards some light it collects light Uh, the raw data is sent to a tracking system the tracking system send it to the ground station and the ground station transmits it to the uh, space telescope science institute and after that the data is released okay just to give you an idea of the spectrum and the size of it and so uh, if you look at radio wave frequencies it would be around few uh, 100 meters and this is in centimeters to the other end of it would be 10 raised to minus 12 so you have uh, nanometers amstroms and so on so as you go away from uh, radio wave to gamma rays so the nasa space telescopes all four telescopes cover different areas so hubble basically is going to cover this area a bit of ultraviolet and a bit of infrared now uh, this would be uh, what a hubble uh, it's not a complete picture but just to give an idea of how uh, it looks like it has solar panels which power the supply uh, right so this is the aperture so it has uh, nickel hydrogen batteries which are i think now replaced with uh, lithium ion batteries so you have the primary here mirror mounted here the antennas the gyroscopes and all the other equipment of spectrographs is kept here so you have the wide field camera here so are the advanced cameras and so on and so forth so this are the uh, cameras which are fit into the hubble space telescopes and this is the part of the spectrum which they cover okay uh so and this is what they would look like and this is a part of the spectrum so let us look at uh, in detail one by one the first one as i said it is uh, advanced camera uh, survey it has three cameras on board and it covers uh, right from 1200 amstrom that is ultraviolet to infrared then we have wide field camera 3 it has it covers visible near ultraviolet and infrared and the resolution of this is much much greater than the other instruments here 
because it was replaced and then we have cos that is cosmic origin spectrograph which basically looks into the uv region only uh, but it is a very very sensitive instrument and the sensitivity of it is around 10 to 70 times so basically if you are looking at very very faint objects then the sensitivity becomes very important and this is uh, you use this camera then. the other is an nic mos which is near infrared camera and multi object spectrograph okay so as the name suggests it is looking at uh, near infrared and the other is stis that is space telescope image spectrograph used to obtain so this is looking at images which are already resolved but with a, a better resolution that's what we want <laughs> what is the other things which are there is uh, BAPS that is birthing and positioning system. So you have to maneuver it. You have to point it in space. Okay. <laughs> the other terms which you would see is GSFS. That is the center where uh, the space telescope is controlled. And the other is a fine guidance system, which keeps it oriented in space. <laughs> now coming to when we are talking of telescopes, uh, we have to talk of the resolving power. Now, just to give you an idea of how the resolving power goes, if you take a human eye, the resolving power is around 60 arc seconds. Now, what is an arc second is, uh, you know, a circle is 360 degrees. So one degree, if you divide it further, it was, that will give you 60 minutes. And then one minute will be further divided into 60 seconds. So we are talking of the resolution of a human eye, which would be 60 arc seconds. Uh, the human eye diameter is around, you can take it as 4 mm. Uh, Galileo's telescopes, uh, and the diameter was maybe around 8 mm, uh, yeah, 8 to 10 centimeters, I think. <laughs> so the resolution there is 3 arc seconds. Then you have the Earth based telescopes, which have a resolution of one arc second and Hubble has a resolution of 0 0.05 seconds. Okay, no physics is complete without few equations. So I had to put uh, at least one equation here. <clears throat> so basically uh, you can, I'm not going to details of this. This is the formula for this. And then this is how you calculate it. Okay, so I think everybody does this formula for resolving power of telescopes and uh, mi microscopes and so on and so forth. So let's look at a schematic of how the Hubble uh, is there from the, so this is where the light enters. Uh, the light, so it's a reflecting uh, telescope. So the light falls on this primary mirror, which is all focused to a secondary mirror. And then after this is focused on the secondary mirror, it is sent through this uh, to the equipment and where it would be analyzed. Okay, so uh, this uh, this is something which you would act and it would orient towards the earth magnetic field. So this a few of them. Okay. <coughs> uh, I'm audible, no problem with it. Yeah, yeah, you are very much audible. Uh, no, sometimes I you have to. So the primary mirror, so the diameter of this primary mirror is around 2.4 meters. So it is the one which is going to capture all the light. Now you would say, why put a telescope in space? The main reason for that is that we don't want the Earth's atmosphere to pollute the light which is coming into the atmosphere. So you put a telescope which is uh, in the orbit. So, but this is a low orbit telescope. We need to understand that it's not at a very high orbit. Uh, so when it was launched in 1990 and the first images which they got were blurry. Now you have spent uh, crores of rupees and then you, the images which are coming out were blurry. <clears throat> so they searched for an answer and they found that uh, it was due to spherical aberration. 
now all physics students know what spherical aberration is okay spherical aberration is that that means the mirror somewhere is not po uh, polished properly now these are all parabolic mirrors not spherical mirrors you should understand that uh, if it is a spherical mirror it will not focus to a point and you know you learned in a parabola there's only a single focal point so all of them are in parabolic shape now let us look at what was the aberration the flaw in the polish of the mirror was 150th of the thickness of a sheet of paper so you can imagine it is 150th of a sheet of paper means that is the difference in the thickness at at a few places which was there and this was giving blurry images now what do you do if you uh, if your vision becomes blurry you use glasses right so but now how do you correct this because uh, that uh, telescope is already in space okay so they had to spend uh, send space missions to uh, repair hubble and that's where they did it in 1993 a series of small mirrors uh, was used to intercept this uh, light which was flawed and corrected okay so and ast astronomers also replaced the few of the equipment on board and they replaced the wild field planetary camera with wild field wild field planetary camera 2 okay uh, so i'll skip this so the uh, coaster is nothing but that small mirrors which will fix this so these are uh, the astronauts who are actually fixing the hubble space telescope <coughs> it is docked to the station uh, the space shuttle and then the repairs are carried out and then uh, hubble is left back normally when they leave it they leave it again back at a slightly higher uh, altitude so that no because hubble uh, is uh, deorbiting because of the atmosphere so these are the space missions where uh, five space missions were carried out and after that uh, the space shuttle was uh, dismantled because after challenge uh, challenger was burnt out when it entered the atmosphere so mirror images shown here mostly contained uh, images from wild field planetary camera 2 and wild field cam uh, camera 3 okay so wild field camera 3 was the last one <coughs> sorry to be installed wild field ca planetary camera had 48 filters now there were some narrow band filters and broad band filters narrow band filters normally used for studying okay. atomic transitions okay. and the uh, broad band okay. filters okay. 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 colors of stars and galaxies so if you want to study galaxies and stars you will have to use the broad band filters let us look at the history of how this image is started so you all know that galileo was the first one to use the telescope to look at the four but when he published his papers he didn't have any images so what he had done was he drew those images with hand and then published his paper in the 20th beginning 20th century people started using filter cameras uh, so they used to have red filter green and blue and uh, each layer they used to put one on another and then finally produce an image <clears throat> so astronomical data from modern telescopes are no longer captured on films as sir has already pointed out you use ccds <clears throat> they are digital that generate require processing in order to create an image <clears throat> sorry so the journey is from hand drawn images to photo mechanically produced images uh, the idea was that we want to uh, eliminate the human hand in it Uh, so let's look whether we are able to do that so complete objectivity and neutrality in the interpretation of scientific data in pictorial form is not feasible nor is it desired so basically you have to translate this ones into zeros into pixels the data received by the telescope has a variation of brightness with no inherent color 
the ccd is not going to in our case is uh, not going to capture any color so the pixels are not like rbg pixels they all uh, pixels which are going to have a monochromatic uh, images they're going to be. so but how do you create those uh, color images so that part of the data will come from the filters so astronomers can see from radio frequency to gamma rays so all of you know that we can see only visible part of the spectrum so i will have to add color to this images even in ultraviolet and infrared so image processes uh, put together the color map that translates a portion of the data into various colors <clears throat> so hubble is using ccd so i think i'll not go, go into those because sir has already covered uh, so ccd cameras uh see the ordinary cameras which you have they have pixels which are red blue and green put side by side okay so but uh, in hubble uh, it's not like that because you want to use you make use of the maximum space available there but the telescope does have various filters so that's where the uh, we know the filter we are using and we know the light the photo of the same object is taken through multiple filters so if you're looking at an object so you change your filters and take the images scientists can then combine the images and assign colors to those images now for faint objects you have to wait a little bit longer because there will be only few photons coming in <laughs> maybe in a day only 10 photons also can come in <clears throat> so you have to wait okay so now you would say which is better taking monochromatic images or the rgb images now there is upside and downside to both of them you using color camera save times you click you don't like to you would not like to wait to take a photograph right on earth so or your mobile cameras or the other cameras so that's fine but here uh, in hubble space telescope uh, we are going to use a monochromatic camera so what we want is that any photon which strikes anywhere on the space should be recorded the camera gives you more freedom of which wavelength you are looking at the image okay uh, and since you are using filter you will be catching less light because the other image uh, other photons have been cut off and therefore you need a longer exposure which method is better depends on what you are going to image the type of image you want and the time you are able to uh, willing to spend on the single image okay so this is the criteria <coughs> then you would say why add color at all okay if the color involves manipulation wouldn't it be better with the original black and white versions see why do we need to do that the assumption is that Uh, behind manipulations, uh, see so you are spending uh, crores of rupees of government money. <clears throat> so finally, you have to uh, tell the general public also what it is being spent on. Okay, to add value and information. So when you comes in the public domain, people appreciate that. So you are adding a value to the information which you are generating. Make the presence of the data aesthetically pleasing. make information accessible through those photographs make material understandable so i'll come to that bit later color is used as an analytical tool here okay so a human eye <coughs> sorry or a earth based telescope will not be able to see a very very faint object but i would like to put it on the photograph that there is an object which is faint but it is there so i need to add some colors to that color is used to depict infrared and ultraviolet color can highlight uh, delicate features and that would be otherwise lost in a photograph okay i should know what am i looking at what is the information coming out of it the term false color is often used to describe astronomy images whose colors represents outside the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum 
so the rgb colors are chosen to represent characteristics of what i can uh, color the whole uh, image through just having temperature as a criteria or energy or chemical composition so when you look at a herbal image you should look carefully that what is the color combination of that image and what those colors are actually indicating whether it's temperature whether it's energy or whether it's a com chemical composition that you're looking at <clears throat> false color images are only a matter of different visual codes okay now let me come to this uh, eagle nebula which is the most celebrated image uh, of hubble which was one of the first images now you have two images side by side here the image 1 and 2 okay this is also known as pillars of creation this image is taken by an earth based telescope this is taken by the hubble space telescope <clears throat> now look at the color code so 673 nanometers is assigned red okay so all of you know that uh, uh, red is around 6000 and violet is around 4000 okay so when we looked at the spectrum 657 nanometers which is again red actually okay is assigned green <clears throat> and 502 nanometers which is around uh, turquoise blue you can say is assigned blue color so you are not assigned the actual colors here now look at the earth based telescope 650 nanometers is red you have assigned red 539 nanometers green you have assigned green and 451 nanometers is blue you have assigned blue so a human eye would see this <coughs> but the hubble space telescope is using a different color combination so it is not a one to one correspondence so here 657 nanometers which is red but in the photograph it is going to go as green okay so look at the difference in this yeah what they actually mean also we'll go to that okay so this is what would look like but then this photograph is much more uh, has much more information than this even though it is the actual color which you have assigned it so both images so are actually composite images from three monochromatic images right so filter used 673 i have already explained is red okay but i have assigned it red but here this is red but i have assigned it green here it is green we have assigned it blue <coughs> here it is red to red green to green blue to blue but how many uh, okay so this is <coughs> what we would actually see but why has hubble done this so some people would say the color in the hubble images are fake okay it's not a one to one correspondence the other image was an actual image uh, actual color because the images don't reflect what it would look like to the human eye but most color images are fake if you take it like that <laughs> okay why this has been done because this image is not representing the temperature you can say this rep is representing the chemical composition of the images which are there in that <coughs> pillars of creation so actually 673 nanometers is ionized sulfur i mean if you take ionized sulfur in the laboratories you will get 673 nanometers that has been assigned red uh, so it is giving red we have assigned it red okay so ionized nitrogen and hydrogen alpha and part of the spectrum is red this also is red in the spectrum but we have assigned it green and 502 nanometer that is oxygen uh, it is again ionized oxygen <laughs> which is uh, green turquoise we have assigned it blue so basically i mean i am looking at this image you have to look at at a more of a chemical composition which is there the elements which are giving the spectrum so 
this different views can help to better see and understand the structure of this object so what is the color code <coughs> used by hubble or they also known as hubble colors so sulfur is red hydrogen is green oxygen blue so when you look at this image okay so wherever you see blue you have to think there is oxygen right when you see it's greenish you have to take as a hydrogen and wherever you see reddish it is sulfur so this is how you read the image okay so therefore should we say that the image has fake the images are not fake for example if you photograph yourself in an infrared region okay so you would look different in that image but as a person you are not a fake person so it is a image of you only but in a different uh, bandwidth okay now this is uh, you can see the picture on the left hand side this is what actually hubble sends so it's a black and white photograph right so and then you add colors to this this you would see that this image is not a square there is like no uh, the step sort of thing because this image was taken with four photographs uh, four cameras and when you want to finally create an image all the cameras have to be brought to the same um uh, uh, what do you call uh, resolution okay so the cameras are at different resolution so you have to scale down the images to the same resolution it's nothing that no this is small therefore it is a cut or something nothing sort of like this this image was taken by four cameras <clears throat> and they had to be combined with the same resolution so therefore you would see that so here you can see that this image is taken by wild field planetary camera 2 okay and this image itself is 5 light years tall huh? so we need to look at this this is not just a small image so if light starts from here it will take a 5 light years to reach them now this is the same image of the uh, m16 or the eagle nebula but this image is been taken by wild field camera 3 uh, the next version of it so here oxygen is blue sulfur is orange and hydrogen is green now you can see here there's a lot of uh, halo which is bluish greenish so uh, that means there is a lot of star activity going on this is the nebula and the stars are getting formed there and therefore they are uh, this is a very hot place and therefore the gas around it uh, would get heated up and that's why you see an halo sort of thing you can see it here you can see it here you can see it here so this is in the visible range now i'll show you the same image in infrared how it looks like and the same image in x ray region the same picture okay so the same picture which is taken in an infrared region now you can see that most of this dust you can't see in the infrared region you can see inside <laughs> and you can see that there are a lot of stars beyond as well as within the pillars of creation but here you see it is still dense and you can see the halo right so this is where the stars are being born let us look at the same image from x ray point of view so this was taken by chandra okay now you can see this blue image here okay so most of the stars when they are being born are very active they are emitting a lot of x rays okay and so we can actually see that yes this halo is there so we can pinpoint out that there is a star which is being born and the size of it is <coughs> around 4 to 5 times that of the sun okay so am i clear so i have shown you the images of pillars of creation taken from different cameras how they look like okay and so on so 
the herbals uh, colors is red for sulfur green hydrogen blue oxygen so this are the same images okay image 1 which is colored wherever you find this traces of sulfur you color it red then you take the image wherever you find hydrogen you color it green color it blue and then combine it so it would gives this con size kind of a image uh, which is there so this image has been uh, uh, produced from 48 images uh, 48 pictures sorry not images 48 pictures sent by hubble from infrared to ultraviolet now this is another picture of the lagoon nebula now this picture in the top is an actual picture with taken with a color camera on the earth okay now to this picture i want to add what are the elements which i have found through the hubble space telescopes so on that info on that picture we'll add uh, wherever we find traces of hydrogen oxygen and sulfur we will we will use hos hydrogen oxygen sulfur so if it is reversed then you need to see uh, how it is done okay so here it would be uh, red uh, yeah this is green blue and red uh ilai garo uh is there yeah please go ahead sir 10 more minutes you know we have time uh, i'll try to maybe that is not sufficient for you i think yeah i'll try my best i'm yeah. already going fast uh, yeah. yeah so yeah. now this is an image uh, now here uh, the chemical elements information is not there if i look at this image i have to look at the spectrum so any energy between 2 and 3.3 kilo electron volt will be coded as red 3.3 to 4.7 will be coded as green and 4.7 to 8.8 kilo electron volt will be coded as uh, blue so here uh, and this image is not taken by hubble this is in the x ray region so now the other important part of any astronomy is that spectroscopy so i think all physics students do some spectroscopy in the lab so take it seriously because it's one of the fundamental tools which scientists use to study the universe why to study it because the spectral lines will give you information about the elements temperature density magnetic field speed at which the stars are moving the angular speed mass size and the material around the stars <coughs> all this information can be got from this now the other is a, what is the chemical composition of the stars now the chemical composition of stars uh, now as i said does that mean that the chemical composition of stars varies widely initially our scientists thought the answer was yes but then uh, you actually use the magnus formula and then people were able to show that no it is 90% is hydrogen and 10% is helium okay and then there is the interstellar medium which i'll skip now let's come to the uh, star formation how the stars are formed so if you look at the tips these are all the points where you can see some activities going on these are called as eggs or also evaporating gas globules okay this is the first stage of star formation after that as the core temperature increases because it is accumulating a lot of dust and this thing so this is an image where you can see this four stars now this is taken in the visible range of wild field planetary camera 2 and this is taken in the near infrared camera multi <coughs> object spectrograph okay now you can see that this four points they look very very bright here in the infrared so there is a lot of activity so that means they are still getting formed so it's the same picture but 
taken in different uh, with different cameras and different part of the spectrum i'll just uh, complete this uh, formation of solar systems in a one slide normally you would say how was the earth formed also so it's basically a protostar which starts forming and then the core lights up and when it lights up it is going to throw all the material surrounding it so it's going to push all that material outside and those materials over a period of time will come together form lumps and okay and maybe form some planets and so on so uh, you can look how many years it takes for this so people are looking for you know solar system or uh, like us elsewhere <clears throat> so the stars have been formed so will they die yes obviously something which is born will going to be dying so eventually the stars will deplete their fuel they're going to burn their fuel and then they're going to die how are they going to die will depends upon how they are born okay so if you take like a sun then the sun is going to become a white dwarf a red giant and a white dwarf okay so if they are much bigger than eight size more than eight times the size of the sun okay then they will uh, become a red giant and a neutron star i'll go to that slide <laughs> so this is you can say life cycle of a star just like you say the steady life cycle of a butterfly or something right so these are the nebulas right then they start accumulating all the dust clouds okay and then the core starts heating up uh, the air forming the eggs or the uh, global uh, glo uh, globules okay then you have a protostar okay now if it is smaller than the sun it may just go to a brown dwarf okay but like a sun once a protostar the star is born it goes on the main sequence what is called as the main sequence so now the sun our sun which is the nearest star to us is on this main sequence and some day it will become a red giant okay so when it becomes a red giant the whole earth and everything will be wiped out then it will become a white dwarf because it will be still radiating some energy which is left out and then finally the ray, that emission also will stop and it will become a black dwarf now i said depending on the mass if the mass is more than the eight times then th that goes into what is called as a supernova now and if it is more than 30 times it will be the supernova can go as a black hole or a neutron star so when they die as a neutron star okay or when they die as a white dwarf this is where they're going to throw the elements from the core some of it and then this dust comes back again to the nebulas and then this goes on so uh, this is a red giant to a white dwarf now here you can see that this uh, is taken by hubble space telescope in the helix nebula 2004 here you can see oxygen so wherever you see blue that is oxygen and hydrogen and where nitrogen is red okay so this is how it looks like so supernovas i told you supernovas will basically emit in x ray okay i visible as well as infrared so you have to use all the three data now you would say how are this captured because there was no recent explosion but once the explosion happens the wreckage is there and the light which we are receiving is billions of light years uh, when the event has happened so you are actually looking into the past so this stars would have exploded long back but then that light is still reaching us <laughs> so that's how scientists are able to recreate this uh, using color code now this color code here used is the energy is used as a color code here okay so what they have done is uh, blue so whatever images from x rays given blue and uh, x rays from this region are given as green and the other from visible and infrared are given red 
so here also uh, these are some of the remnants of explosions which are there so you can see the red okay uh, then blue and green so these are uh, you should take that that are energies okay now uh, the crab nebula explosion which had happened thousand years back which was recorded by a chinese uh, astronomer in this form okay now uh, but scientists are able to recreate this and let's see how it looks now so this is the image the scientists have created of an explosion which has happened a thousand years ago so blue is neutral oxygen green is ionized sulfur and red is doubly ionized oxygen let's come to an another image of eta carina this eta carina is 100 times bigger than our sun so it is you put 100 suns together and then this is what you get since it is so huge it is very very unstable and it throws a lot of dust and gas so it's very very unstable you can see from the image it is throwing a lot of material out okay so this would be the next uh, supernova which we will be able to see okay so this is an active one which is in space now the same image if you look from x rays this is how would it would look like okay uh, this is x ray and this is infrared okay and this is obviously the visible range the other contribution of hubble before hubble uh, there was no conclusive proof for black holes so one of our professors used to say oh what do you do on black holes you can't even see them but we are able to map them so astronomers decided to examine uh, direct hubble to examine uh, the center of the galaxies okay now the center of the galaxies uh, what hubble has found is that using very very simple physics is that the stars uh, move at a relatively slow speed okay uh, so they discovered stars close to the center of the galaxies zoom around at a very high speed okay so this should not be the case as you see they should go with a specific speed but then what you see is that they are zooming around this with very very high speeds so the core if you take if you take the center this is again it's not a picture this is an you can assume it to be an artistic impression okay so this area is zooming around very very fast if you don't assume there to be a black hole the simple laws of physics are not able to explain it so therefore you assume that there is some super massive black holes and because of that this uh, material or this uh, thing is going around this very very fast okay so all uh, and the interesting part of is that all galaxies uh, which we have found have super massive black holes at the center of the galaxies okay this is a mystery but then uh, this super massive black holes uh we need to study and let's see how it has evolved into those galaxies so they play a very very important role <laughs> the other is hubble's deep field view now somebody uh, some astronomer decided to <coughs> focus this telescope into a dark pitch of sky okay means it's completely empty and he wanted the hubble space telescope to be pointed in that completely uh, dark region so one very very important thing is that at no point of time the hubble space telescope can point towards the sun if it points towards the sun the whole equipment will go off okay so it has always has to point away from the sun now uh, some of the astronomers felt it was very silly you no know, why you want to focus because hubble space telescope time is very very important but he said no i want to study this dark patch of sky <clears throat> and then he pointed at, the, at that region for many days and to the surprise uh, 
this was supposed to be an uh, area like this, which was just dark, nothing. But then to his surprise, he found that so many of these galaxies and something. So astronomers became very, very excited saying that you're looking at a dark patch in sky and then you were able to discover because these photons are coming very, very far off. That means you're actually looking very deep into the sky. Okay, so the, you can look here 300 nanometers is assigned as ultraviolet, 606 is given red color, 650 is blue, 814 is the near infrared. Okay, so people got so excited, then they said, okay, let's look further down. So this is, you can say is the big bang where the whole uh, drama started. Then the, you have, this is the radiation zone, dark ages, the st first star formations and first galaxies to be formed. So Hubble deep field view is somewhere here. The telescope is here. So this is uh, the normal galaxies which you see uh, with the other telescope. And this is the age in billions of years. Okay, so Hubble's deep field view is still somewhere here. Okay. Now, some people wanted to look further, and that is called as the ultra deep field view. So you look still further down, that is back in time. So you're basically looking back in time. And if you're able to look here, then you will be able to see galaxy formations. And this is where Hubble is able to see till this, till this point. Okay. So this is a deep field view, and we have extreme deep field views which are captured by uh, a ACS and uh, wild field cameras. So Hubble spectroscopy confirms the farthest galaxy. So it helps us understand the age of the universe. So previous data was held by this. Now, if you look at this on the top, it is how do Hubble, uh, how do people decide what is the age of the universe? So they basically look at the red shift I think all of you have done Doppler effect and you know what a red shift and a blue shift is. Okay, and this is the age. So the previous red shift which was observed by the stars was around 8.68 and the age of the universe which we could look back is 13 million years. Now recently they have found this which has a red shift of 11.1. .1. Okay, so the farthest galaxy ever seen in the universe that is named as GNZ11. Okay, and that is around, uh, you can say 13.4 billion years. Okay, if you can go back further, okay, uh, the, the James Webb telescope uh, intends to look somewhere further and James Webb's telescope will be in the infrared region. So what we want to do is go back and see how the Big Bang so coming to a very, very important thing, I think uh, this should, uh, many people have a misconception about this. <clears throat> okay. So what Hubble has found about the beginning of the universe, Hubble has measured the age and size of the universe before, uh, better than before. Okay. So you have new data. So the question is, was Big Bang an explosion? Okay. Normally, everybody assumes that there was some explosion which was of a conventional type and then the big bang started that's a wrong way of looking at big bang theory it's not an explosion it is an expansion what do i mean by an expansion at big bang the space and time was created so space itself is being created so if you to give a very simple example if you're taking like say uh, two stars the stars are fixed, but the space between those stars itself is increasing. So the space is expanding and it is, uh, you need to understand that space and time itself was created and you would not take it as an explosion. Why not an explosion? If you say an explosion, then there has to be a point where the explosion happened. And there is no point of explosion in Big Bang. So if there was a Big Bang, if you assume, then the next question would be, uh, please tell us where the explosion actually happened. Okay, uh, 
and then there is no reference point for that so we don't take the big bang as an explosion so next time you say it is an expansion or it is a creation of space and time itself you would say that what about the earth and moon let's say yeah the space between earth and moon also is increasing it is increasing very very slow but the space they are fixed but the space itself among them is increasing so how galaxies rotate did not make much sense as the arms of the spiral ga galaxy tend to move faster than the laws of would allow now i'm coming to galaxies uh, here i'm basically going to dark matter and how this so what i do is uh, this edges which i and i calculate i do the calculation for this at the rate at which they are going around the laws of physics don't allow it because if i add up the whole mass okay so the whole mass of this galaxy will try to hold it together with gravity and the centrifugal force will try to throw it out right so the whole mass in this galaxy is not sufficient to hold it there at that speed okay so if it is not able to hold it there the <laughs> loss then how do i explain this okay so we try to look at an answer for this is that yeah so that is what we call as dark matter okay so galaxies are surrounded by a hail of unknown form of matter okay this matter acts like a glue and holds the universe together yes hubble has been able to map this dark matter so even though we don't know much of its properties but the map is there we call it dark matter how has hubble been able to map it uh, if you look at uh, relativity or general relativity what it says is that if you have huge mass here okay and the space time uh, the space and time around this will get curved so we let's say we are here or the hubble is here and this star is or galaxy is exactly behind it so what do you expect to see nothing you will be not able to see this because this is exactly behind it but the point is that you are able to see it so this is called as gravitational lensing just like you put ordinary lenses in optics to bend light to focus it here that job is done by gravity okay because the space time is itself curved and the light is going along a straight path which is the curved path itself and therefore you can see this galaxy which is exactly behind this okay so what is the universe made up of so the universe is made up of 4% of matter which we actually know so 22% of it is dark energy or dark matter okay so 22% is dark matter which i just told you it has been mapped and the 74% remaining of it is we have no clue of what it is still okay so what is the 74% of the universe made up of the answer to this again comes from hubble or hubble's data you can say okay so after the uh, uh, big bang okay after the expansion we assume that as uh, matter is being created from energy and gravity is pulling it uh, uh, this thing uh, together so the gravity should slow it down so over a period of time the expansion of the universe should slow down that is what we expect or believe that the universe is slowing down okay there it was a team of two experts who looked at the hubble's data and the data showed them something different what they found is that the uh, universe is not slowing down It, but it is getting accelerated it is expanding at an accelerated rate so hubble's finding does not fit the expected model 
for expansion of the universe but uh, okay so it's not uh, expansion of the universe but it is showing us that it is accelerating so it is not just expansion but there is an acceleration that is what hubble's data is showing us the galaxies with supernova are not just moving away okay they are moving at an accelerated rate okay hubble's hubble's results convince astronomers to think of the universe in an entirely new way the value of the universe expansion rate you may say now what is the accuracy of your calculation you are saying it is accelerating so how how much to believe that data okay so we have to look at that it has been pre calculated pre with a precision of 3% so there is no problem with the data part of it so in nor normally in a lab experiment also you accept the result up to 5% if this is much much lower than that which is 3% it can be refined further let's so the new value implies that dark energy really is a steady push so as you know that uh, we have four fundamental forces in nature uh, people were playing with this idea of a fifth force which is like pushing the universe or uh, apart okay so steady push on the universe as einstein imagined with this gravitational constant i think i end my talk with this any questions i would like to maybe yeah thank you thank you shekhar garu hmm. thank you for that wonderful presentation uh, yeah sir has got a question